And we are recording. David Weck, thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Thank you very much, Ryan. I'm, I'm glad we got to get this in. Yeah, that, that worked out good. Um, so you're known as the guy that's telling these elite coaches for sprinters and that they're doing it wrong and that actually the fastest people on the planet are actually doing it right. And for some reason, uh, not everybody believes you. <laughs> so can you uh, just uh, explain what, what is, what's going on? All right, so there's a number of factors. I'm gonna try to, uh, I'm gonna dial it back to get a big perspective on things. Um, everything I say governed by common sense, right? And nothing is, you know, sacrosanct. You just got to analyze it, get to the bottom of it. And, you know, feelings are hurt because ideas are people's babies. And then what you've done for your career and how you've sort of hung your hat and sort of advertised yourself as expert. If it is wrong, well, that's a tough, bitter pill to swallow. And what I'm doing is I'm not sugarcoating anything for anyone. Okay. And I'm either right or I'm wrong, but I'm right because this is the biomechanics of speed, okay? So click, click is the definitive answer. I'll make any person faster. You take any coach, coach the guy for as long as you want, girl you want, run your time. Now come study with me for one week and I will make you faster because I know what I'm doing. It's about loading the ground, okay? Efficiency, that's what it's about. And the fact of the matter is I've already studied everybody out there who is there to study. Okay, so I know your notes. You don't know me. I'm coming from left field. I'm this outlier, right? The BOSU ball afforded me the 40,000 hours of whatever I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was be the best in balance, measured by local motion, to get to the truth and make every step stronger for everyone. And I subscribe to the idea the best idea wins. And it's a relentless pursuit of better that gets us there. And there's a mission much bigger than myself which is physical education is the foundation for optimizing human potential, right? So we're in a situation where back pain is epidemic and you, you don't learn to speak the language you speak by studying it. You, you're raised in it. it you know, it, you would learn it by osmosis. You copy others around you. And when a majority of people around you don't walk with efficiency because right. the head's in the middle right. and every single step they take is not right. balanced, but the athletes do, right. but the athletes are coached to right. do the wrong thing. Right. Everything's upside down. And so I'm also not going to apologize for the right. fact that I run a business. Okay. And I have a business interest in this because my company is the one that's right. changing the game. And now you don't have a choice, but to follow. And if you don't want to follow, that's up to you, but you can't hold your breath forever. And there's nobody teaching a high jump who does the Western roll, okay? So now let's back it up a second and let's look at the reasons why, okay? There's no money in the study of biomechanics of sprinting. You know why there's no money? Because there's nobody over 25 who sprints unless you're that much of the population who's fortunate enough to get paid to sprint, okay? So you don't go to Dick Sporting Good at 40 years old looking for track spikes. You just don't do that. You're not looking for track blocks. You're not looking for that stuff. So there's no money. Hey! Come on now. Is that bothering you too much? Uh, it's it's kind of loud, but I, I think it's okay. You want me to hit I'll hit pause. Gonna, this, you, know what, you know what I love about this? And I hope your viewers are cool with this. This is an organic movement, okay? Yeah. It's happening for real. I'm not sugarcoating. I'm not BSing. I'm just telling the truth. I'm David versus Goliath. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, overproduced and you know all this you know sort of huddle up and say the right thing that's so played i'm sick and tired of it right yeah. we gotta say there's so much bs that everybody's sick and tired of it, all right so back to the point there's no money in the study of biomechanics to speak there's none okay the study is in the biochemistry because we all know that makes you faster right so you yeah. push the envelope it's cat and mouse right justin gatlin's been flagged what three times well, the third time doesn't count because he didn't do it. Right? Okay, well, maybe he didn't, but he did it before, right? And he's not the only one. You can make a strong case that just about everybody's done it. And I'm not making ac accusations. I'm just speaking reality. Right. The, pressure to, the pressure to win is so intense and the rewards are so great that if I were on the bubble, if I were running a 10-1 and I could get down to a 10-8, I mean a 9-8, 
shoot me now. Shoot me now, mm -hmm. right? And it's perfectly okay if you have testicular cancer to get a little enhancement. So it's the great dilemma because what are we teaching the kids, right? So we got to lie to them. And lying is essential to, if I asked you, hey, Ryan, how you doing? And you're doing crappy. You're going to say, hey, man, I'm doing fine. How are you, right? It's a social mm -hmm. lubricant, the little white lie. So it's all all right, all right? And so here's the deal, right? You got to follow the money. You always got to follow the money. So it's NFL, NBA, it's, it's, it's baseball. In America, those are our big money sports. And that's where the athletic pool of talent goes. And if you took all the money out of those three sports and you put it into track and field, people would know a lot more. And Usain Bolt would not be the fastest man on earth. All right? That's just the way I look at it. Okay? Because you put that much money into it, and now you're going to get NBA guys and NFL guys really trying to run their fastest. Really? Yeah. Right? So if you say Bolt is the fastest, he's the fastest by like a hundred or a thousands of a second in that game. Okay? Right. So again, back to the idea that there's no money in the study of speed. Okay? Relatively speaking, nothing compared to what they study for bicycles that cost a lot of money, golf clubs that cost a lot of money, right? All these other things where people spend their money. Now, you have the hierarchy, you have the experts, you have the authorities on the subject of speed, and they are under a tremendous pressure to perform right now. You can't take a practice session and devote it to, hey, I have an idea. It might not work, but let's see if it does, right? There's no room for that at the elite level. That's the best way to lose your job and to lose the confidence of the athlete that you're working with, all right? Yeah. And I happen to know that the protectionism and the little kingdoms, fiefdoms, and the moats and the walls, right? Oh, it's my athlete, right? So there's not a lot of sharing of ideas either. And the, the, the extent that you're sharing ideas, you basically go to the conference, you all pat each other on the back. Yeah, 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 we know, right? And you, as a result, you have the best in the world teaching fundamental things that are incorrect and having fundamental opinions and beliefs about things that are fundamentally incorrect, right? And I'm just a kid in the crowd looking at the king saying, hey, I don't see clothes, right? <laughs> I'm either right or I'm wrong. Doesn't matter, right? Because if I'm wrong, guess what? Show me right, and now I'm right, right? <laughs> I'm not afraid. So that's basically it from a bigger picture. And now we just come back to the idea of balance, right? If you're not balanced, you can't optimize. It means there's compensation, and compensation by definition is not optimal. Now, I know I'm talking a mile a minute, and you've got questions, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to convey the message to people because the inertia and the glacial pace of change, if the powers that be are able to control the story, is intolerable. And I'm not going to wait, all right? I'm a kid from New Jersey. And you can take the kid out of Jersey, but you're not going to take the Jersey out of the kid. I got a chip on my shoulder, right? I'm not going to pretend I don't. And at some point, I'll be Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'll be cool. <laughs> but right now, I'm not, okay? So I'm challenging people. And I'm saying, put your ideas into the arena against mine. And if you disagree with me, then really say it. Double down on your bet that I'm wrong and you're right. Brace the core. Keep the head in the middle. Keep your shoulders level. Go for it. Swing your arms nice and 90-90. Go for it right? Because I know with certainty that they're wrong because they're not balanced and they don't, they don't optimize the, what we have, right? Gravity is the fundamental law. That's gravity. That's the truth. It's God's way of keeping everybody honest, right? Because right. if I could teleport, I sure would do it. I'd pick that over walking any day, but that I can't cool. do that. Neither can anyone else yet. So anyway, that's sort of, that's, that's, that's how I want to kick it off. And then we can dig into some of the specifics. But it's all part of a bigger picture where I invent the BOSU ball, which in its own right is misunderstood, especially by the people who are, you know, big and strong and tough. And then the people who sort of do their research on products that aren't a BOSU ball, that now all of a sudden scientifically BOSU balls make you weaker, but you didn't study a BOSU ball. You did some questionable protocol. You had your confirmation bias. You knew the result you were going to get. You got it. And now you publish an article. And all of a sudden, everybody's talking about science, about why a BOSU ball is bad, right? So I'm here to ring a bell. I'm here to say, stand up. 
right? I'm going to center on a playground and any bully who wants to come take the mic, take it, take it, take it from me, shut me up. So I'm on fire. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you make sense to me. And it's, it's stuff that I was, that maybe didn't make sense to me at, at first. And then I learned about you or um, I don't know if it was through Steve Cotter originally, but I knew um, he was just on the podcast last week, but I'd never met him personally before that, but I respected him. I've known about him for 10 years as a kettlebell instructor, high level. And uh, so, and then he's talking about how great your method is and that you're a genius and like, okay, well, if he's saying that he doesn't have to say that. So I start looking into it and it's like, okay, this is different than what I'm thinking. So what, what do I need to learn? What am I, um, what am I missing? Cause I'm open-minded. If, if I'm, if I, I train people for a living, people give me money, they expect me to know what's going on. And so I'm looking and I remember watching, um, a video breakdown that you were doing and it was of another video breakdown. And I think it was Michael Johnson breaking down Usain Bolt. Is that right? And he was talking about, I don't know if he used the, the word energy leaks, but the, the concept of energy leaks. So if you're sprinting, you need that core tight because if you have these energy leaks, like you would have like in, uh, in weightlifting or something like that, where energy leak meaning like a, people don't know, like a, a muscle that's too lax. It, it's not uh, contracted. So you're losing, you're, you're not transferring your power because of these muscles that aren't firing in the right order or, and so Michael Johnson, who is a elite track and field is telling, is saying Usain Bolt is running wrong and he's the fastest guy ever. Right? So, and then you're saying, okay, well actually Usain Bolt is doing it right. It's this coaching that's wrong. So can you talk more specifically about, um, the energy leaks and the, um, the coiling core spinal engine. Can you just explain that and why that that's better and that the going for the bracing and the, you know, keeping there from being an energy leak like we would have in weightlifting or something is not the way to go when you're sprinting or running at all. Yes. There's two principal, uh, reasons why I think at the at sort of the heart of why there's tremendous confusion and misunderstanding that the first one is that everything's happening so fast that you can't see what's happening unless you go slow motion frame by frame okay five steps a second and is very very fast okay so you can't see what's happening in real time I don't trust my naked eye because the eye in the sky doesn't lie you can misinterpret the eye in the sky and not know what you're talking about based on some preconceived notion, but you can't truly see it until you slow it down frame by frame. Now, you got to know what to look at when you slow it down frame by frame. And if you're looking at it from the side, which is where everybody looks at it, because that's where you can tell the angles and you can see who wins the race for crying out loud, mm -hmm. right? You got to look at it from the front to understand it, right? You got to look at it from the front because and then you got to figure out like, okay, where did we come from, right? And you can make certain speculative guesses about, okay, well, let's play the evolution theory, right? Regardless of what you believe, let's just look at it from that perspective, right? First movement on, on this planet from animals was side bending in water, right? This mechanical action to get to food and not be food hmm. was essentially what started the game for the animal, right? For the animal kingdom. Now, enough of this leads to this segmented ossified spine that is the paradigm for the vertebrae, the vertebrates, okay? So that leads to fish, fish, these multicellular organisms that still do this because they're buoyant in water and it becomes the Piscean strategy. Now, let's take them out of the water. Let's turn their fins into legs, right? You amphibians and reptiles where the legs come out the side. All of a sudden, you don't have buoyancy. You got to counter rotate. You got to lift. The, you got to lift the shoulder because that's progress without energy. I brace the core and I start doing that. Well, no lizard moves like that. The lizard that wants to move like that is a dead lizard. Okay, there's no baby lizards that make it if they if they are you know somatically physically stupid. Okay, 
So that's the truth. Now, the mammalian strategy is prop it up. Put the sagittal plane into it. Create more potential energy by lifting yourself up. Don't have the legs here. Lizard can lay on a rock for a month and not eat anything. You know, true paleo diet. The, the mammal, they, they're spending energy. You got to eat every day. You got to eat every day because you're propped up now, right? You're warm blood. But you can pounce now. You got all three dimensions of movement better than the lizard, right? So you can be more successful as the mammal, okay? So what are we? We're the mammal that essentially climbed up the tree to get this vertical relationship with gravity and create this, this exceptional polarity between the brain and the tail, all right? And there's a spinal fluid that washes up and down the spine, right? It's all about the spine. It's the, electro, the electrical core that controls everything. And there's something very, very special about polarity. Extreme yang, extreme yin, if you look at it from the Chinese perspective. So once you get the vertical, it's my belief that the animal's like, oh, wow, that's really, really cool because I can find the line now. Ooh, I can find the efficiency, right? So now what you do is you, you use that prop up and the crutch of the stick, the tree, etc. And now you figure out, oh, if I can balance and free up these things that used to be designated for moving, I can comb my hair. I, I can pat my belly and, and do whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I can do anything. Now I can pick up a stick, right? I can pick up a stone and then I can light fire on the stick and fire on the stick stands down any creature other than the other hominid who can control fire on a stick. And guess what else I can do with fire on a stick? I can blow the flame out and now I got a pen. Now I can start to write stuff down, right? Mm. Now I can really leverage, right? I can talk to you and you don't even have to be there, right? You don't have yeah. to even be born yet, but I can still talk to you. I can pass along my knowledge, my information that is more esoteric. It's not, the, it's not the knowledge that, oh, I am a rabbit and I got to be scared stiff all the time because I'm going to get eaten at any moment, right? That's passed on. It's not a lion who's like, okay, teach the kids how to play and wrestle around so that they can, you know, get the gazelle. No, we can say, hey, you know what? <laughs> we can tell ourselves stories with the pen, okay? We're the homo say pen, say pen. That's who we are. We're the most successful hominid because we had the code to pass on information that the other hominids couldn't understand, right? They're making funny noises that, that they can organize and they can now set traps, right? We, the meek shall inherit the earth because it's brain. It's the motivation to innovate from not having the physical gifts. That's my story. Had I been physically gifted, I'd be a pro athlete. I wouldn't know any of what I know now. I'd be being coached by some guy telling me to brace my core. And if I were a good athlete, I wouldn't be doing it, right? right. So it's the cyclical thing. So that's sort of the, the, the context for the misunderstanding, okay? And now it's, it's so confused that a guy like Michael Johnson doesn't know what he himself does. Let's go to the video, Michael. Let's go to the video. Let's, no, oh, you're harnessing the Piscean strategy, right? The side bending with that counter transverse rotation, right? That's the spinal engine. It stems from the core. That's where it stems from because that's the most efficient. It's the most powerful. I magnify the sagittal extension and flexion power when I, boom, I coil and I rotate my core. Now, Grakovetsky, who coined the term spinal engine, he had it right from a skeletal standpoint, but he didn't have it right from the myofascial standpoint. He missed the big picture. He missed the lats. You start talking about multifidi and all these little tiny things along the spine as, as the strength mechanism, well, you're just, you're off. What they're there to do is they're there to fine tune the interaction and the, and, the, and the interplay between all those multiple joints that's critical so you don't kink the cord. You got, you got these, even the names in the anatomy books, you know, Lovator Costi Brevis, Lovator Costi Longus. Is the job of that muscle really to raise the lid or raise the ribs? Or is the job of that muscle to fine tune the articulation of the spine? Uh, okay, which answer is it? Come on, come on, right? 
those muscles aren't designed to hold. Of course, in inspiration, they participate in it, but that's not what they're really, really there for. And so you got those muscles have to play the piano, right? They serve the larger purpose by keeping the integrity of the signal, the integrity of the skeletal structure in a fine tuning sense. So Gracovesi starts thinking about all that stuff. He's like, well, that's not strong enough to do it. It all has to rest on the lumbar dorsal fascia. Well, you're partly right, dude, because the lumbar dorsal fascia, that is the lats. That's the base of the lats. The lats bridge the hips and the shoulders. The lats happen to directionally coil the core, shoulder down and back, same side hip up and forward. Keep the ninth rib in the same spot so the center goes straight down the track. And you got the spinal engine. It's literally that simple. And a singular focus on the function of the ipsilateral one lat at a time to coil the core, shoulder down and back, same side hip up and forward, center goes straight, put your head over your foot where you're balanced, you're coiled to bang, get to the next step. And you say Bolt happens to be very, very, very good at this. Okay? He's not optimized. And think about the last time he ran really fast, like 958 and 963. Okay, well, it was a long time ago. And if, we're, if, if we need to take out this energy leakage, now what do you do? You start programming exercises. You start telling them don't do this, right? Oh, okay. He didn't fulfill his potential. And I think that probably was a contributing factor is that others around him were telling him that he was leaking energy, right? You got you to invest in balance, right? And that's what it's about. Michael Johnson, set your world record. Okay, boom, boom, boom. Come down the track, right? The guys like Maurice Green, when he was the fastest, he knew this. You could see him warming up, visualizing the race, and he's not running, and he's going, right? Tyson Gay, massive. Asafa Powell, massive. Now, Justin Gatlin, less, but he still does it. Allison Felix with the bow legs, once she's up and running, her feet are basically doing this. The head stays here, but she's still using the spinal engine, right? So it's, it's common sense that's not common yet, okay? And again, I invite anybody, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. You've not studied as much as I've studied. You don't know biomechanics like I do. I don't have any published papers or peer-reviewed articles like Stuart McGill who tells you you got a brace to throw a punch, to throw a ball, to kick, to swing a bat, anything, right? I don't have the peer-reviewed nonsense, right? Pat each other on the back about, oh, yeah, well, the, the, you know what it is? It's a bully culture, right? Mm -hmm. There were bullies where I grew up. You had to deal with it. It's not all bad because you get tough. And I was a little kid who you weren't going to bully because you're going to bully me. I'm going to fight till I die. <laughs> Even if you can beat me, it ain't worth the trouble. I'm not going to go attack some squirrel or a raccoon, especially a raccoon. They're going to tear me <laughs> up, right? Even if I got a rake and I kill that thing, I risk too much. You're going to go after the sheepish one, the weak one, because that's who you are if you're a bully. And you're also going to invest in bigger, stronger, faster, because that kicks ass. Bigger, faster, stronger is better provided you can shape it right. And in the adolescent years, bigger, faster, stronger, that's your, I'll take a 14 year old and give me till he's 17. I could do nothing except for just drink, drink a gallon of milk and bench press. He's going to be faster. He's going to be better. Right. Right. And everything he does. Now there's a diminishing return to it. And did you optimize this function? No, but bigger, faster, stronger is the mode. And sagittal 50, 50 lifts, the deadlift, the squat, the bench press, the sagittal lifts are sort of the, you know, that's the holy trinity of bigger, faster, stronger foundation. So you, so, okay, well now, well, that got me bigger, faster, stronger. Well, that must be what I have to do all the time, right? And so now you lose the fluidity because it's not even coached into you. And sagittal is much more easy to exercise and measure, right? Because, oh, I can squat and I know how much I, you know, it's the weight, right? It's the truth. It's scale says 700, scale says 695. Well, 700 is more, he's stronger. Right? It's just, it's so easy, right? But the fact of the matter is, like the rotational stuff, that's not exercise. Like, oh, I can throw the discus farther, right? Okay, well, that's very specialized, a lot of factors. And so you have to specialize in the rotation. Now, in our fitness industry, which again, there's not a lot of money in the fitness industry other than the bullshit and the tricks and the stupid gizmo on TV. That's where the money is. 
Drive Go into a health club. The money, the money in the health club is okay. Well, you know, we got uh, you know fifty stairmasters, right? You, mm. you don't need personnel. You don't need manpower. Right? Just you know, do that, right? That's where the money is. It's not the money in the free weights, right? The, at least not historically speaking. So you got to follow the money in the fitness industry. The money's in the bullshit. That's where people get really rich. And if you're not in the money, well, then where's all the brain power go? Where's all the incentive go? And I'm not saying people are dumb. There's very smart people. But you're not digging like you dig if you're trying to, you know, make an atom bomb, right? There's not a Manhattan Project to say, hey, let's make this guy faster or, you know, let's, let's enhance their, their locomotion, right? There's not money in it. So you get all this sort of, you know, misunderstanding that is the foundation. And now, oh, well, you know the foundation. So now you build on that, build on that. And pretty soon you know it, everybody's doing pal-off presses. Well, it, because the fascination with the transverse plane, the transverse plane, oh, rotation, the transverse plane, the transverse plane. Yeah, guess what? You need the frontal plane. You're going to maximize the transverse plane. Because if you don't have the frontal plane, you're twisting. You're twisting. You're not rotating. Twisting's bad for your spine. Hold on just one second. And it's what? Okay. Can we pause it and while my daughter tells me something? Okay. We're back on. Okay, great. So, so basically picking up to this sort of, you know, the fitness industry layering their, their next bit of knowledge on, the, on sort of, there's nothing more basic than locomotion in terms of the gross motor functions. You know, you got the mastication and the cellular respiration, the breathing, those take priority. But next in line from gross motor movement is basically moving from here to there to there to there, right? So that's basically stems the, the foundation of this spinal engine, which is this. If you are so enamored of the transverse plane, that you've just discovered because now you're ahead of the curve, it's all sagittal. Well, no, the next thing is in transverse. And your paradigm is that you have to twist because you don't want to leak energy with figure eights because mm -hmm. you don't know better, right? Because you're trapped in your little cocoon box and you all go to the same conferences, you all pat each other on the back and you read the research and people don't know what they're talking about from an actual functional standpoint, which is where they are. Well, now you're in the conundrum of, well, I, I, can't ro I can't rotate the lumbar spine, but I have to rotate the, tra the, the thoracic spine. You're not rotating, you're twisting. And then you're left in the trap of oh, anti-rotation. Woo, anti-rotation. Let's do a Paloff press. And yeah. you resist the twist, you are weak. I'll walk. If you could bench press 400 pounds and you're big, you're 250 pounds, bench press 500 pounds. If you resist the twist, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> I'm going to kick. I will push you around. You resist the twist. Why? Because I know to figure eight. I'll, I'll make you commit here and I'm going to disappear here and I'll get you here. I'll get you here. I'll get you here and I'll have you spin around and then I'll cut you off air and blood or a vital, right? It's so simple. But you give somebody who's big the same capacity as me, well, now bigger, faster, stronger wins, right? right? And then you have technology where I take a stick, I hide it behind my back, I shake your hand, can we agree? I boom, boom. Now it's my kingdom, right? You mm -hmm. didn't get to kill my kids and kill me and take my women and my things, right? Because I'm the homo sapiens. I'm the homo sapiens. The Neanderthal, there's a very interesting theory that says the Neanderthal preyed upon the the, the hominid, the other hominids, literally ate them and raped, raped them, right? It's, it's not like we all have Neanderthal DNA and it's not like they were like, oh, ooh, ooh, I like him, I like her. No, it was more like, I don't like him, I'm going to kill him, I'm going to take her, have my way, and now it's my kids, right? That's the Neanderthal. Or it's not, I don't know. Makes sense. And you got to evaluate it without fear to at least pull the logical thread through, could it be true? Yes, it could. Does it give you better sort of information for understanding the here and now and the practical results rule? Because I'm of a belief that I don't care what the story is that you tell if you get the result, right? And a long, long time ago, that's what it was, right? You don't bring home the bacon, your family doesn't make it through winter, doesn't matter that you were a nice guy. Doesn't matter that you did all this, 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 right? You didn't go on, right? The music stopped. Your next of kin did not go forward, right? So it's the results that rule, and that's the cold, harsh reality of life, the Darwinian fitness thing that we're all in, okay? 
That's just true. So I care about results and I don't care what story you have to tell yourself to get there. Right? right. And, and I care about common sense. If, if without a figure eight, I mean, reach for the salt behind you on the table and don't, just don't, don't do that. I mean, come on. Just be normal, right? Just, just let it happen. And what I always love is I love like, I have friends who don't know what a femur is. They don't know what myofascia is. They don't care what that is, right? Oh, well, you have a talus bone and it floats and it does this. And we can geek out on it for a thousand years, right? Yeah. They don't care about that. They got bills to pay. They got mouths to feed. They got a life to live, right? I got a ball game to watch. Hey, do you brace your core when you swing a baseball bat? Yo, why are you asking me such a stupid question, right? Because it's common sense that when you get this myopic, sort of concentration of, oh, 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 oh. Now you start saying stupid things even though you're smart. And now you're very threatened by David Weck because he's coming along and he doesn't care. He's willing to be the oddball. He's willing to stand out. And he's not going to shut up. He's not going to shut up. And he's going to challenge you until, until we reach a universal understanding, right? I'm not, I'm not going to rest until it's universal. And either I'm right or I'm wrong. And if I'm right, nothing stands in my way. And if I'm wrong, we all get to a better answer anyway. So it's a win-win. And the fact is that the, the powers that be, the establishment does not like displacement. Rich man doesn't want to get poor. Poor man wants to get rich, right? So if you interpret this as, oh, I'm a rich man, I'm going to get poorer, well, you don't like that. And in the oil industry and sort of, you know, the, the, the lumber industry, lives have been lost because entrenched interests want to stay in power. My favorite sport to watch is boxing. And boxing, historically, one of the most corrupt sports there is. Right. I mean, it because, and those in power ain't going to let, I mean, you can get a chokehold on that, right? And it's the populist that's able to sort of buck the system where they don't have to because they have the people. And it used to be a long, long time ago that there were newspapers and magazines and TV, radio and TV. Those were your, that was your mass communication. That, that was it. There was nothing else. There was no way to bang a drum and anybody hear you unless you had the dollars to, to, to disseminate the newspaper, the magazine, the radio, and the, the TV. And now we got the internet. Anybody can watch this podcast. They can watch it today. They can watch it tomorrow. They can watch it 10 years from now. And it's two guys talking with dogs barking in the background and interruptions because there's a hive of bees swarming on the street, right? Yeah. And, and it's the truth which endures because out there, the person who's going to say, I used to go to that seminar, right? I was in Long mm -hmm. Beach at the Perform Better Seminar, and I heard Stuart McGill say what he said, and I heard this guy say what he said, and I said, and I was scribbling down notes. But wait a minute, it doesn't make sense, and it's not actually what's happening, right? So the little guy, the little guy doesn't need to pay for TV. And my energy, I know, you know, oh, he's caffeinated, he's crazy, like he's da 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 da, -da. I got more energy I'm an entrepreneur on fire and I got a mission that's bigger than myself and I'm articulate and articulate and I'm smart and I'm experienced and I've lost my mind three times. So I've, I've, I've gone to places in the outer realms of the universe and beyond into the multiverse where I got untethered from the here and now I need help to get back. Okay. So in that sense, psychologically, there's nothing that threatens me. Like, I'm not afraid to have the paradigm shift. I'm not afraid of anything because I already, I, already, I already lost three times, right? So now I'm just results rule, and we have the tangible reality that gravity governs all, right? Why do they call it the grave? The rich man, the poor man, the live man, the dead man, gravity across the board. Gravity. That's what the physical matter has to deal with. And it's fight and it's flight that are the fundamental functions that require biomechanical efficiency if you're going to be the best you can be. Right? And a long, long time ago, the Say Pens figured out.
that if I hold a stick and bring that to the party, it mm -hmm. defeats claws, it defeats teeth, it defeats muscles, it defeats everything. If I can leverage the power of a stick, a stone, fire, and cordage, those are the four principal things that changed the game in the beginning and are responsible for why the homo sapiens rule the earth and not the bigger, more mightier Neanderthal or whoever the hell else, gigantic kiss, whatever. Bigfoot's hiding in the woods somewhere. He ain't coming out to play with the little weaklings because mm -hmm. the little weaklings will put him in a zoo. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna cut him up and look at him and see what he is. He doesn't have a chance against smart, right? And I know everything I'm saying is 100% perfect, makes sense, and I'm winning people over, right? So anybody who says they don't believe what I'm saying has to now defend the argument. And... And, and, and an insistence that you're going to continue to defend the unwinnable, the, unwinnable, the unwinnable argument is a form of cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias that only paints yourself deeper and deeper into a corner until the only place to go is dig yourself into a hole. There's these guys on the internet called the gate guys, right? The, the purveyors of expertise and locomotion. And they are fundamentally flawed in their thinking because they don't understand that balance is the priority. But they're so vested in this. The 9,000 podcasts and articles and expertise that you know, are based on this incorrect opinion is too much for them to acknowledge that it's all built on a faulty foundation. right? So they hold fast to this argument. They ignore certain points and come at it from a different perspective. They use intellectual dishonesty to present their argument. And all they're doing is digging themselves deeper and deeper and deeper into a hole. And the way I look at it is the subject of biomechanics and exercise and fitness and all this stuff, this is an extremely boring topic for most people, right? You, me, and Steve Cotter, and you know several thousand others, we like it, but most people could care less. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter to them, right? It's not here and now daily life. There was a time in my life when it didn't matter to me, right? You know, as I, when I hit puberty, that's when I started to care because I started to care about like how weak and skinny I was. How can I make myself faster, bigger, stronger, better, right? Yeah. So I was, I was always coordinated, but I didn't have the, the, the physical prowess to, to you know, impose that coordination upon a baseball, football, whatever you might have called it. Well, I had to use this from the very beginning. In the beginning, it was more to use this for the game, the X's and the O's, and, and you know, do the best I could with the physiology and the biomechanics. But after I stopped playing the game, and then I got the mailbox money from a BOSU ball coming in? Are you kidding me? Oh. It's, you know, it's January 1st. Okay, boom, here's another big check. You can live your life, right? Yeah. And when you're not financially beholden to anybody, well, then you don't have to jump. You don't have to jump. You can do whatever you want today. And since I'm so driven, I invested all my time and a ton of money into my education. It's all I care about. It's what I love because I'm so simple. I'm so simple. Like I don't need my nut for me personally. This is very small. I could live comfortably on a thousand bucks a month if it were just me. I've done it. <laughs> I did it for 10 years in New York city. Right. Yeah. So, and because I'm happy doing what I'm doing, I'm not happy with, you know, the creature comforts or the status symbols. I don't care about that. Right. So for me, every, you know, every, every income incremental dollar above the threshold. Now it's a lot more because I got a family. And I'm getting older, so I'm liking nicer things, but it's basically atmospheric. I just want a kick-ass house on the hill looking over the ocean and provide for my family. That's all I care about. That's all. Now, it's a lot. It's a lot to ask, but that's all. So every incremental zero that I get, that's just gravy, and it's now it's, it's power, it's influence, and it's, it's philanthropic. Right? And I have huge – I went to Williams College. I went to school with, like, sharpest to the sharp. The reason I applied to Williams is because it was rated the number one college in the world <laughs> or in America, whatever. So, oh, I'm going to apply there. Good enough at football that they'll pull me in and you just absorb it. You're there with super smart people. And I covered my ass. I could have gone walk on, worked on Wall Street or the consulting game. I could have done that. I could make my money. But it's just like, you know, like I couldn't do it. I, I would have imploded if I, if I did that. 
I would have exploded. Whatever would have happened to me psychologically, I wouldn't be right because I'm crazy. Okay, right? Thank God I'm crazy. So this, this, this conundrum of we know it, we know fitness, right? We're open-minded for whatever's better, but the fact that better is so upside down than what you think is right. Now, how open are you really when you've been fundamentally wrong? When you've been coaching people to take their spinal muscles, those little intricate muscles that have to play classical music on the piano keys, all 88 keys, right? When you gotta do that, and you're teaching them how to go chong, 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 and that's your paradigm? Well, then it's threatening. When a guy comes along and says, guess what? You're not just wrong, you're dead wrong. You're not just wasting your time, you're counterproductive. Right. And, he, and I'm not blinking either. Stare me down. Hmm. Get up and tell your people. Get up and tell the world. Etch it in stone. Carve it. Right? Send your man, be that guy who proves David Weck wrong, right? I mean, that would be a pretty good place to be at this point in time, and certainly better in the future. Be the guy that shut this kid up. Yeah, there's, it's, it seems like you're, what you're saying, it's, it's really hard to argue with. And even like if I was, I guess when I first started learning about you, I was the brace, the core guy. My certification is strong first. And so we have that, and I think there's a place for that. But Bingo. I, let, me just, let me just say one thing. There is a place for that, and there is expertise in it. And the expertise, I would agree, is endgame expertise, right? We know how to brace the core. Right. It's not like tomorrow we're going to find out that everybody is wrong about bracing the core. Any, I mean, you're X on the map when it comes to bracing the core right? Any other innovation that you get is either going to be technological or just deeper in that same, you know, X on the map for bracing the core, right? Where the game is fundamentally changed is with regard to coiling the core, right? Which, which in turn makes you better at bracing the core. When you ipsilateral go as far as you can with the big boy lat, and then you do the other side and all the other muscles in the body, they come along and now they get to assist Bo Jackson on the team, right? Make your blocks. But give the ball to Bo. Your lats are Bo, right? Oh, but now I did Bo on this side. I did Bo on this side. Well, now when I want to bilaterally pack it, I can concentrate it better, right? I'm stronger at the game you like to play. Right. Yeah, you get more uh, um, neuromuscular efficiency and stuff. Is that that's what you're saying? So. Because I can contract it more over here, and I can contract it more over here, then when it's time to really brace and I'm doing like a, um, a deadlift or a front squat with uh, kettlebells or something like that, I'll be able to um, fire more efficiently to, because of doing the, the, the opposite thing, I can fire more efficiently for the, the squat. That's, is that what you're, you're saying? You're able to just like turn everything on more? Yes, it is essentially what I'm saying. And basically, you got to think of the body as a pressure system, right? So we have this tensegrity structure with the, you know, the compressive elements, which are the bone structure, and then the tension elements, which is the myofascia, connective tissue, and contractile muscles. And it's a pressure system. And you're basically hydraulic with breath being the pneumatics, right? So try and squat without breath. Okay, well, hard to do because you haven't pressurized right, right? And right. so what you need to do is you need to have the myofascial integration that removes all slack from the system. So if I have slack where I don't have the longest and strongest connective tissue, well, now when the muscle, if I don't have the longest and strongest, now when the muscle says go, there's slack, there's movement without motion, right? So what I have to do is I have to take the lat, which the base of which is this myofascia, the fascia, and it knits together with the muscle. And now I have to use this muscle to create the most, like most I can get out of this, the, the, the really, really strong part. You can create a lot more pressure with the connective tissue because it's like, it's, it's not going to elongate. 
<laughs> it's, just, it's just not. It, the, the, that stuff is going to spring. When you try to elongate it, it's going to go bing, right? And so what you want to do when you run, for example, which, you know, it's more functional than lifting a weight. You know, it's not to say that lifting a weight's bad, lifting a weight's good. But when you want to run, you, you basically want, you basically don't want elongation of muscle tissue in the belly, right? What you want is you want a pressure, a pressure that, that bing, you don't do tissue trauma. You don't create metabolic waste. You, you, you're not tired. You're not sore. You just go bing, bing, bing. That's how the animals do it. You're on the, the less time you're on the ground, the less, the less, the less you need to do that. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and so and I'm talking about power, right? So what we want to do is we want to enhance our ability to create productive pressure. It's, it's very, very simple, right? So slack in the system is going to leak the, the, the pressure, right? We want to pressurize to our best of abilities. And so it's the myofascial relationship that's going to allow you to do that because everything serves the bones. The skeleton is the priority, right? The skeleton is that which is going to regulate that, that instantaneous constant flow of the calcium ions to keep the cells functioning, right? Send an astronaut up in space and, well, hey, we're going to pull the calcium from the lowest common denominator, efficiency. We'll just pull it out of the bones. And so the bones are there to deossify if necessary to keep you alive because keeping you alive at the cellular balance level is a priority over keeping you a balance in the, in the motility game, right? And the bones, that's where you build your blood. Right, the marrow of the bones, the stem cells. That you know, I mean, it's the bones. The bones last. What do we have? Right, unless you preserve that mummy real well, then you're gonna have dried up leather. Mm. <laughs> but, but you know, it's the bones. The bones, the bones, the bones. So, it, and the bones give us structure. The bones give us strength. And here's a theory that I'm working on. I don't know if it's true or not, but the reason why, when you're 40, you're just not as springy and as fast as when you were 20. I think it has as much to do with the bone structure as anything else mm. because I can be stronger at 40 than I was at 20, but I sure ain't going to jump as high and I'm not going to run as fast. Right. And I think if you think of a bow and arrow, you know, the bow, it's a tensegrity. If you know, you're going to use that model of a compressive element, which is the bow itself. And then the tensile element, which is the string and what gives it power. It's really not the string. What gives it power is, is, is the bow, right? Mm -hmm. But what if the bones are more elastic when they're younger, which they, mm -hmm. they are? Sure. What, if, what if they're so elastic in the beginning that you don't have power? And then what if they come into sort of their range as you reach that 18 to, you know, 27, 30, whatever, you know, maybe we're pushing the boundaries now. But what if they sort of hit that sweet spot where they resonate with the biggest, like, sort of, ping, you know, at that point in time. And then what if you're getting older and they're just getting more brittle and less springy? Because I can be stronger, both in terms of a connective tissue and muscular standpoint, when I'm 40, than when I'm more springy, right? And I don't know if this is so, I just, here's what I do, I think. I think, and I'm willing to be wrong, I, I could care less, because it's only the result that I matter. It, 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 so if I, if I go off the track and it's not right, okay, well, you know, spend a little bit of time, spend a little energy, whatever. I, at least I can cross that off as, okay, well, we don't have to go down there again. Mm -hmm. But if I ever went down there, how the hell am I going to know? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. I remember, uh, I think you posted something about that on Facebook before, and I, I thought that that made sense, this, the springy bone theory and then – not having that as we age and uh you remind me of something when um, you say like bow and arrow so i i do i teach most of my uh strength and conditioning classes at a, a wilderness survival school and i'm not the wilderness survival expert but uh we'll do um like foam arrow wars so the kids will shoot i, mean, I teach like as young as like seven years old and they're shooting foam arrows at each other and they're climbing and maybe they're climbing up a tree and they're carrying arrows up a tr or bows and arrows up a tree and running and uh uh you were saying something before um uh, on a, another post that you did and you're talking about how humans would have sticks and we're running with sticks 
and now you have you created uh, pulsars, and you're saying that you know like getting away from like the you know the ninety ninety running and uh, more of this uh, pulsing, and then you created the pulsars, and you were relating the motion to us running with sticks. So can yeah. you uh, like put that all to all together for us? Absolutely. So at, at, at for for the longest time. The, the uh, capacity to carry a stick long enough to be of functional value for both hunting and defense was the priority. So without the stick, we're not here, right? So now the burden of carrying that stick will make you run slower, but it's also going to attenuate what is possible when you run. So if I have the long stick, well, then sort of by definition – at least with that arm, I can't swing it, right? It's just too long. So it's going to end up hitting the ground. It's going to end up being, you know, super, super slow. So you got to sort of, you got to sort of bounce it. You know, as, you, as you're running, you got you to sort of pulse. And there also, in, in my way of thinking, it was Satchel Page back then. Like, you know, if, if you can run and not sprint, well, then run. And if you can, you know, walk and not run, well, then walk. And if you can sit rather than stand, well, then do that. You can lie down, take a nap, do that. And when they call you out to throw the pitch, boom, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. efficiency was the game. They didn't have Gatorade tables and, you know, gel packs that they carried, right? It was all much more precious, the caloric value. So, you know, the manipulation of this stuff was all for leverage and – that's, that's what gave us the ability to create the leisure time where we can play games that are essentially little, little models for the warfare and for the hunting. Because now you can play games with foam arrows and, you know, seven-year-olds shooting arrows, right? And it's all sort of related to where we come from. So the, the, the carriage of that stick really is what forced us to, to not swing the arms. And I think you were walking when you could and you were jogging as it sort of became necessary to, you know, to get there a little faster as you're zeroing in on the animal or, or get, you know, sort of the vantage point on the hill so that you can, because we were trackers, right? Mm -hmm. And not sprinters on a track, but trackers, right? Oh, look at the disturbance in the dirt right here. Well, oh, that's his hoof. And I mean, that's what we became expert at. And then, you know, sort of the ability to, Think of this, you've got the stick in your hand, you see a track and you know the other guys are behind you. So what you do now is you carve a big arrow, you know, make a big disturbance in the dirt that points to this little thing so the guy behind you can you know, sure, sure not miss it. It's another form of writing. We're the homo sapiens. Hmm. We are the homo sapiens. That's who we are. That's why we won. And what's next is man and machine. And that's a whole other thing. And now... At stake in that is, is consciousness itself. So now the next transition is bigger and more radical than anything we can even imagine. And what I want my role to be is to help, help ensure, if it is in fact God's will, that consciousness survives, right? Because I used to be an actor for 10 years. And the way I look at things, it's, it's a script. It's a story. So if you're going to play characters, put yourself in their shoes, look at it from their perspective, what would you do? Now, if, if I were all powerful, what I'd want to do is sure not know what's coming next. Okay. Uh, that would be hell for eternity to, to never see anything new, never anything surprising. I mean, can you imagine how bad that would be if there was never anything else that, that, that you didn't know was going to happen? And if I had that capacity, I would choose to deceive myself, to, to con myself into not knowing so that it's just a better way to spend time. Yeah, if you, it's interesting that you bring it up like that. It's, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, part of my, uh, I'm, uh, I have an audition Tuesday for, it's like the Walk the Talk series. It's kind of like a TED Talk sort of thing. And, uh, I don't need to get into all of it, but like part of it is, uh, it's on signs and synchronicities, but, um, like m the last part of it is like, we can get these like signs and synchronicities that kind of let us know that there's more to this life than what we can easily see, but we can't know what's going to happen in like you, whether you're with, uh, um, 
So like, why didn't it work out with your high school girlfriend or, you know, and then why not, why didn't it work out with your uh, college girlfriend or, and it, it might not, it doesn't make any sense at the time. It, everything seems cool, but why did it? And then you look back and it was like, Oh, that makes sense. Cause this other thing had to happen. So yeah, it's just really interesting. That's what that made me think of. It, that was like a, a, a profound thing that I've been, uh, I guess, meditating on sitting with and really thinking about is not knowing what's, uh, coming up and, and just kind of following your path. But, uh, so, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, go ahead and, uh, no, no, that, I think that's a, that's a useful observation to help, you know, one, one of the, one of the challenges that I had in the past and perhaps, you know, struggle with a little bit now, um, is, is making what I'm saying, uh, tangible and understandable for, for, for others. Right. And so with regard to my prescriptive, what to do to, you know, move better and be, you know, physically more capable, I've been able to distill it down into just, you know, it's only now the gem. There's absolutely nothing but the gem. I can tell you how to coil the core. I can tell you how to do it with any modality and you get instant carryover. Oh yeah, that worked. Right. And then the long-term carryover of keep on laying that down. And then the, the consequence that you get better packing and bracing of the, you know, of the whole core from that coil. Boom. Now pulsers that changes the game entirely. Okay. You can run faster with weights in your hands than you can without. That's so different and so crazy and so counterintuitive that people don't, I mean, to grasp even the magnitude of that. If it weren't true, well, then it would be completely insane if it weren't true. But I figured it out, right? I figured it out. I invented a way to enable anybody to run like Deion Sanders ran and Randy Moss and Lawrence Taylor and Daryl Green and Usain Bolt himself, but even better mechanics than Usain because all those other guys had better pulsing mechanics than Usain himself, but Usain still pulsed. I mean, your shoulder does not come up at both ends unless you're dropping it down on both ends, right? You know, you, you swing the arm like you told and your shoulder ain't going to be popping up. So the key is when on. If you just step back and think of it, right? Just step back and think of it, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back and I'm going to help people think of it. If this foot is about to hit the ground, why on earth do I want the hand coming up when that foot's coming down? Why on earth? On earth, yeah, right here, mm -hmm. on earth. Why do I want that to happen? Because my track coach told me? Because that's what I think I see? Like, Really? You want to hold to your argument? You want to tell me to shut up? Go for it, right? Why on earth do I want to do that and have to wait for a muscular stop to pull it back? Don't I just want to go ba boom and let up be free? Mm. Be on the ground, less time, less cost, less energy. Don't I want that? It's faster, feels better. Why in the hell would I not want that? Okay, now I want that. Yes, you do. Well, how do you get it? It's virtually impossible to teach anybody without my invention. Virtually impossible. I've no, I was doing this. When I discovered this posture right here, it's called the core fist. You triangulate the bone so that the force coming out gets rooted back in and your shoulder's more fluid when you put more pressure. It's exactly opposite of this because this is meant to hold the stick. It's not meant to punch and it's not meant to squeeze empty handed, right? That's for holding the stick. It articulates great and it's why we're here. So this is more important from an evolutionary standpoint than this. This is a very cultured, civilized thing when I don't have to wield the weapon. And the internal consequence of knowing this is profound. I can pop both of these core fists in and I can go boom. And now the tensegrity is like, oh, hmm. it's the closest thing to floating that you can do by expressing muscular tension. Now, as soon as I discovered this, bang, my swinging paradigm is gone. I used to think you have to spiral the arms, right? Because that's efficient for swinging. And as soon as I figured out this, which this is what helped me figure it out, right? As soon as I figured this out, I went like that when Shane Mosley hit Mayweather in the second round of their fight in 2010, boom, and then that night I went like that, and I said, aha. So mm -hmm. now, all of a sudden, 
All of a sudden, I ain't gonna swing. I'm gonna strike. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, now, I knew that since what, 2010? I couldn't teach it to anybody. Because when the pressure's on and you wanna go fast, you're gonna resort to that what you know. And you're not gonna listen to the instruction because you didn't have the biofeedback to do it. Right? right? So it takes me, takes me seven years to figure out the invention that, that gives you this methodology that is faster fundamentally, leaves you with the muscle memory that you're faster than you were before when you're not carrying it or them, but you're faster carrying them. Like what? I am making gloves with pulsive cartridges. You can change the oh. angle, right? It's, it's, for, it's for fight. It's for flight. It's for both, right? Pulsers, zero advertisements as of the time that we were recording this. Zero advertisements. I'm in, I'm in what, 17 countries, maybe 18 countries already? I got thousands of units in the marketplace. Zero advertisements. Why? Because that, it's true. Mm -hmm. And once you feel it, you know it. And once you know it, you do it. And then once you do it, well, you tell a friend, right? And then you got people sitting on the sidelines. You got people sitting on the sidelines the authorities, at least some of them, and <laughs> God only knows what they're thinking. God only knows what they're thinking. Because, it. ooh, maybe I'll wait and see. Ooh, where's the science? I talked to a guy who runs a company. It's one of the better known ones. They sell products. They have, you know, their summits, you know, and a list of presenters who's the who's who. And I said, hey, I just want to let you know that these things are here. You run faster carrying weights. We've done it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. We've never not been successful, blah, blah, blah. And the first thing he says to me is he says, well, you're going to need the science. <laughs> what? What? Click, click. How is that not science? Like, what do I need? I need Stuart McGill to bless me? <laughs> what do I need? Like, why, why is that important? Right? It's important to you because you don't want the change. You don't understand the change because it eviscerates your position as the authority, as the no, right? You're, you're now displaced. You're not the expert anymore. It's, and, I'm, and look, people could call me arrogant. I don't give a shit. I'm not arrogant. And you meet me in person, and I'm much more chill than this, much, much more chill than this, right? Well, it, what I'm doing is I'm on a mission to make change, and I'm going to be the guy because I am the guy before it happened. I'm saying that it's true. I'm predicting the future. It's crystal ball. I'm the guy that changed the way the entire world runs. That's who I am, right? Oh, and guess what? That's just the tip of the iceberg, what I'm going to do with your hands, right? Because what I'm going to do for your feet, think of, think of where we are right now with our feet, okay? Think of where we are with our feet. Back, you know, some time ago, there was a Incredible coach in Oregon who started padding the shoes, right? Cook them up in a waffle iron or rubber and put them on the bottom and now it's more comfortable. Okay, great. <laughs> Industrious student athlete says, hey, we can make these things in Japan. That's a lot cheaper than Germany where Adidas, who's King Kong, makes theirs. And with the leftover money, we can pay athletes. We can pay the influencers, right? Yeah. We can literally take Michael Jordan, who was so into Adidas, he wore it in high school, he wore it in college, he wanted to wear it in the NBA, and we can pay him enough money that he boom, flies our flag, flies our flag, right? And same thing in the running world, but running world's less sexy, but they started in the running world, and all of a sudden it's comfortable. Mm. It's comfortable. The first step feels so nice. Second step. <laughs> It feels so nice. It feels so nice. It feels so nice. But you're running down a, a, a vortex into a pit because on your 10,000 step, guess what? Don't feel so nice. And it doesn't hurt your feet. It hurts your back. It hurts your body. And that eventually makes it way down to your feet. And your feet hurt. Your back hurts. Everything hurts. And it's because somebody out there changed the game. And because they were so financially successful, one of the greatest brand marketing companies on earth earth can take this sloping cushion put it under your feet force every other manufacturer's shoes to do the same thing because you ain't going to win unless you're doing what's winning and 80 percent of the runners today are injured during any given year and the shoes that are being sold 
do not give you the capacity to move with optimal biomechanics. I can't wear any of those shoes because I can feel the pain of the comfort because they don't let you run right. Now, here's what I have to say. Right here. I'm not gonna pay people a billion dollars to fly the flag. Because mm -hmm. they're gonna fly the flag on the inside from the heart, right? You'd be a fool not to take the money from the monsters. Go for it, right? Eat McDonald's, Tiger Woods can drive his Buick, right? <laughs> right. You can do all that stuff. You can play the game, you can make your money, but Unless you want to be the best you want to be, and if you're an athlete, you have no choice, but boom That's on the inside all of a sudden now, right? And I know how to make shoes. I'm not funded right now to build the shoes and distribute the, the shoes, and I'm sure not going to borrow the money. I'm going to do it organically so I don't have to cut myself up. I don't have to be public. I don't have to answer to shareholders this quarter because that's not in the interest of humanity. That's not the interest of long-term value, sustainability, right? You start playing that short-term game and you end up, you know, a lot of problems, right? So yeah. what I'm going to do is when I'm ready, I'm not telling anybody how to make shoes yet. That would be foolish. But I'm going to tell everybody how to make shoes when I'm ready to put those shoes on your feet. And my shoes are going to meet you where you are and they're going to walk you progressively every step stronger, and then your kids are gonna move differently and we have a new world, it's a new game. This is the flood. And those not willing to build their own boat, right? I'm giving you the code. I teach everybody these exercises for free. Can't hold your breath forever. And you're gonna run out of oxygen tanks eventually. So when the flood is here and the kids know better, well, now I'm accomplishing my mission. Every step stronger, relentless pursuit of better, physical education is the foundation of human optimization. That is, that, is the, that, is, that is what this is. It's those three things. Where do you live? You live in your body, right? When you fly to New York from, from the West Coast, do you still live on the West Coast? Or do you live right here? Mm. Where do you live? When you go to church, do you, do you still live at your house? Or do you live right here, right now in your body? Physical education. How do you breathe? What's your posture? How do you move, right? That's the most important thing you have to make everything else better. And, and again, I'm as competitive as anybody else. And I'm a kid from New Jersey, and I'm either going to win or I'm going to die trying, but that's it. I burn the boats, baby. I burn the boats. You don't, you, don't, you don't go out into the marketplace talking the way I'm talking about if you, you know, want to keep a boat on shore or so back up. There's no backing up. There's no backing up. And when I back up, it's back to go forward because it's a figure, right? Oh, you want to push here? Okay, great. Take it. Boom. Just boom, 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 boom. It's like the big guy who's all bracing his core. It's easy to push around. He don't know how to use his body. And if he only knew, and I can make I can make a guy better in literally one day, first session, in an hour. It's like, oh, my God, right? It's a whole new paradigm. It's a quantum leap in performance that puts you on a better trajectory for the rest of your life. And how long did it take? Why do I have to wait? Why do I have to wait? Because conventionally I had to wait? Okay, well, let's do a pal-off press. Oh, man, that's really tough. It's so hard. Oh, my God. I'm so, wow, that's a great exercise. What? Is that the criteria with which we're going to measure the functional you know, value of an exercise because it got you tired? Is that it? Really? Really? Mark my words, Paloff Press goes away. And just could, and I got nothing against John Paloff. Nothing. And you can derive. I just coiled. I just coiled. All right, now, now all of a sudden it's okay. Here, 50-50, no, 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 no. You coil, good, now you're doing something good, right? And don't tell me, oh, I already knew that, because you didn't, because you're teaching mm -hmm. this, right? And, and another thing that this bold approach that I have does is it basically, I am first to market. There is nobody that can take my ideas and steal them, because that's what happens in our industry. You have these little pockets. The best example I know is battling ropes from John Brookfield. Yeah. They are in every single gym, and most people have no idea the source and the origin, right? 
because you bought your ropes from somewhere else and they call it something else and it's power ropes and it's undulating ropes and it's de -de 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 -de, right it's you know they have no idea who he is they have no idea who he is and they, there's no there's no sort of you know going back to the source perhaps the source might know some things that you know the copycats and the me too's might not know now it's not to say that the copycats can't innovate and you know make things that have value and you know advance the art and the science but ain't nobody gets the steel whack method and call it their own because you we live in a day where credibility is king because now the little guy the little this is all on record you're gonna be able to go back so the big boys can't steal my ideas and call them their own they have to literally copy and because in in biomechanics there is an end game meaning that you have a structural reality the means by which of controlling and moving that structure will reveal an optimal strategy or plan and the high jump is the best example of this reality the fosbury flop going over the bar arching your back backward gets you over the bar and your center of mass never got over it. If you do any other way, the center of mass has to go over the bar. And if you allow me to go over that same height bar, but my center of mass only has to be here, it doesn't have to be here, well then it's an advantage that's too good that you cannot afford not to avail yourself of that biomechanical strategy. And there's no better way. Even if you put kangaroo springs on, there's no better way. Mm -hmm. If I can get over a bar where the center of mass doesn't have to get over the bar, well, by definition, it's better. Right. And, there's no, and there's no other way. And what I've done is I've done that for locomotion. High jump appeals to that many. Locomotion appeals to how many? Billions of people. Billions of people. And now what this is all going to do is this is going to cast an entirely new light on the BOSU ball, Right. Because I know why the BOSU ball is successful at the root, okay? At the root. And just because you're a big, strong guy and you saw people doing silly things on it, you, you know, it'll emasculate you if you even you know, look at it. Well, guess what? There is so much value in the BOSU ball that makes you, no matter who you are, better. And now there's a new BOSU ball that's specifically engineered for strength training? Oh, David, what do you mean that limit force elastics represents this, this unique way to, to stimulate the speed of the electricity, the nervous system, the speed? Oh, yeah, there is. You can compress elastic and you can stretch elastic. Think of stretching elastic. If I take a slingshot and I lift the marble up 100 pounds and I take a 100-pound weight, when I let go, bah, bang, that gets to the ground, bing, so fast, and 100 pounds goes, boom, 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, where it gets really interesting is I can take the marble, and I can pull it much more than 100, let's say 500, right? And I let go of 500, and bing, bing, it gets to the ground faster than 100. So what does that mean? It means the x-axis goes up in a linear fashion, but the y-axis goes up exponentially. So for every increment of force that you can put toward elastics till you get to the limit, the limit is where change happens. The limit is where change happens. It's a fundamental principle. The limit is where it happens. So if I go to my limit and I get this highly dynamic charged expression of force and I can't go any further, I can't go, boom. I've excited the nervous system to now fire faster. Oh, I can do that with a BOSU ball? Yes, you bet your sweet bippy. And guess what else it does? It gives you center line strength. Center line strength. Oh, what's that? Well, find out because now you're going to do everything you do better. Oh, I can, I can engage the adductors. The adductors as a muscle group both flex and extend the hip, the hips. They do two functions that are opposed and opposite at the same joint. So it's not like a hamstring where it's the hip and the knee, it's the hip and the hip with the adductors. 
And that's because the fundamental pattern of locomotion is figure eights. Figure eights. When you do it, you can't be great without the figure eight. And the adductors are both going to flex and extend. And if you think about it, when in life is it practical to squeeze your legs together under resistance? And very, very small fraction of, of the percentage of functions that, that it's advantageous to squeeze your legs together against resistance. When your legs are coming together with the adductors, it's an open chain event. There's no, there's no restriction to the in. It's deflection and extension and the figure eighting. And then on a closed chain standpoint, you can pull yourself down into the squat more productively. Oh, that gives me a better position, better leverage to, to lift heavier weights from training with a BOSU ball? You mean that thing that's a joke and only sissies do it and they're stupid, you know, circus tricks? You mean that thing can make me stronger? Yes, in fact, it can make you stronger. Yes, in fact, it does make you stronger. I don't care what study was done using Dynadisc inflatable cushions that can't, that give you not the unique balance of stability and instability as a BOSU ball. I don't care that you did that study. I don't care that you put the pal off press on the map because those two things are a disservice to humanity itself. Take the mic and tell me I'm wrong. Take the mic and tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I definitely, uh, won't be doing that. Um, your uh, your method is, I think it's like like you're, you're, it's it's so advanced that people don't even know what they're looking at. Not yet, not yet, and, not yet. Uh, but you're doing uh, stuff on the Bosu ball, like kettlebell swings, and it's not the same. It's not really like sport style swings, and it's not hard it's, style swings. It's it's not about the swing. See, that's the magic. It's not about the swing. It's about the compression. The swing just represents a a a a a, 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 force. a, a concentric and eccentric acts, uh, action that changes the vertical displacement of your center of mass. But the focus is the compression. So what happens is you're doing the compression, and we're using the resistance of a kettlebell to time and coordinate the vertical displacement with the compression force. So now I have greater range of using it, right? And you want to talk about lighting the glutes on fire unlike anything you, felt, anything you felt before. And the stronger you are, the faster and more intense the effect happens because you're cresting out on that nervous system with the speed, the speed, the speed. So it's not gravity speed. It's elastic speed, limit force where the change happens, right? And here's what WEC method is. Here's what this is, okay? It's salt it's pepper, it's sugar, it's spice, if that's all you want it to be. I ain't gonna hijack your workout, I ain't gonna hijack your time or your energy, right? I'll call your core, both sides, less than 45 seconds, right? Bing, okay, done, right? What did it do? It just primed you to be better, right now. Oh, you mean I could do that in the morning, I could do that at noon, I could do that at night, and I'm gonna get better and better and better, and how many, how many minutes did I spend in the day? Practically nothing. And I'm still charged and I'm energetic, do everything else I want to do. Yes, that's right. Salt, pepper, sugar, spice, right? If that's all you want it to be. But you want the whole buffet? You want to WEC methodize everything that you do? Well, come to the WEC method lab and train with me or one of the guys who trains others with WEC method. And we're going to give you the whole buffet. The entire thing is WEC methodized. Every single aspect, every minute is what we do. We do nothing conventionally because we do, we, we, we've sort of made it for our purposes, which our purposes, it has nothing to do with your performance in the gym. We don't care. And it doesn't correlate to any performance that you're going to do competing with weights. It doesn't matter. We still want to get you wicked strong. We're still going to we're still going to load up your, we're going to load up your deadlift with a trap bar heavier than you can load it up conventionally. So we're not pussies. We're not, we're not weaklings, right? We do things different because all I care about is results. And I'm, if you want to be better at deadlifting or benching or squatting, like I'm salt, pepper, sugar, and spice. So you do my stuff. It's going to make you better at that, but go to somebody else who's expert in that for all the fine nuance and detail and, you know, programming ranges, et cetera. 
because they specialize in that. You're competing in that game. I'm not competing in that game. I don't compete in the things that have uh, a never ending resistance. You know, if you compete in weightlifting, you're never done. Right, because once you're heavier, you just got to go heavier. I'm competing in things where there is a finite amount of mass to move. A baseball weighs what a baseball weighs. Your body's going to weigh what it's going to weigh. So I'm moving the body. I'm moving the baseball. I'm moving the lacrosse. I'm moving something where now extra strength in moving the bar is not. It, it, you reach a diminishing return where, where it press, and now it's going to reduce your ability to move the baseball. The, the stronger and stronger you get that moving the bar. Right? So, so I'm not competing in the realm of the gym. I don't care about it. And nothing is sacrosanct. Absolutely nothing is sacrosanct, including what I know and what I do. I've changed my opinion 180 degrees too. I used to be a big arm swinger. Now I know. Now I know. Mm -hmm. That fast. That fast there's no there's no if you're afraid of change well then you're afraid of life itself right because the only constant the only constant is change and if you're so hung up if you're so hung up in what you did before is sort of the record and you know changing it is going to jeopardize my position well, guess what you're not as good as you otherwise can be it's not only because your failure to your failure to change it this level here compromise your ability to tick tag it up higher and higher and higher. So not only are you behind, you compound being behind because you haven't been open to the innovations that are revealed from better understanding at the more fundamental level. Right. Yeah. Uh, something I had a, a yoga teacher on and she said something cool that I liked. She was like, yoga is not taught from teacher to student. It's taught from student to student. And so it's like, I think this makes a lot of sense because if, if you're like, okay, you know that you're right about what you're doing, but you're not, you're not done. You're still figuring stuff out and you're thinking about, you're like, I already know that this isn't true anymore because I have this and I can prove it. But you're not just like, okay, now I'm, I'm ready for the, this, this, the final product. Here's my final thought. It's like, you're, you're still figuring stuff out and you're like, I might be wrong about this. I've kind of been thinking about this and so that that taught student to student thing really because I tried to, you know, I've been, I started doing jujitsu like 20 years ago. When I go train with my buddy Blake, I wear my white belt for, for a reason. He, he beats me up real easy. He has, you know, almost 90, 90 pounds on me, but still super technical. And it's like that, that white belt is like, I'll just keep wearing that. And I mean, I had, I've had higher rank than that, but I love it. I love it. it. Uh, well, I was try to keep that open mind and and you were talking about McGill earlier. Well, I have a, this buddy of mine. He's a trainer at uh, the other gym that I work. I work at a um, wilderness survival school and also a personal training studio. And he was having some uh, back problems, back injury. And I had Stuart McGill's Ultimate Back Fitness and Performance book. And I gave it to him to borrow. This is just a couple days ago. And then... I sent him a, a message, and I think we even talked about it on when he came on my podcast, but I, I gave him that book, and I was like, now look at what David Weck has to say about Stuart McGill. And so it's like Stuart McGill, has, he has a good reputation. Uh, you can't say that he's right about everything, and you're, you're here to say, here's where he's wrong. And so it's like, oh, I don't just try to say, oh, I'm on McGill's team, so – I'm not going to pay attention to you because I'm on McGill's team. I'm a strong first guy. I can't look at what Steve Cotter's doing because he's not a Steve, he's not a strong first guy. Or I can't look at Valerie Fedorenko. It's like, okay, this guy. What does this guy have? What's the same? What's he saying that's the same? Now, what's he saying that's different? And could and what can I learn? Because I'm trying to be the best trainer. I want to have the best podcast on the planet. I want to be the best trainer humanly possible. And it would be doing my clients a disservice and being uh, um, fake. If I'm not learning from the people who I think are the most cutting edge, I start looking at you and, you know, however many years ago that was, and it's like, I don't understand this. It's like, and I'm, I'm trying to understand and you're uh, really uh, um, open on, uh, on Facebook. So when people are asking you questions, 
they're, you're, you're answering them, you're spelling it out. You, you did that for me. Cause I was like, I don't understand what you mean by this. And you're, you're typing it out. It, it takes you a long time to write this stuff out. I'm sure. But you, you want to get this message out. So, uh, um, I guess that was my point. I don't know if I had if I had an exact question for. Well, that. I have a, yeah. that 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 uh, I have a response to that. Now, Stuart McGill is of tremendous value, right? A lot of his work is excellent, right? And you know, from from a, the only thing that you don't want to do that these people think you should do is resist the twist. The Paloff Press is the stupid thing. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, Bracing your core against, you know, a sagittal movement as a, as a training mechanism, yes, go for it, right? That, that's good. And, and, and side plank, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not necessarily bad. You, could, you can make an adjustment, makes it better. But resisting transverse in a neutral position is stupid because there's, not, there's never a circumstance in your life where you want to do that. You never want to. What? Uh, what? What can? You, what's the? What? What's your side plank improvement? Well, side plank improvement. You want to understand that it, that that frontal plane alone is never what it is, right? This, the frontal plane. You have to have the, the counter rotation concomitant to the the, the frontal plane. So it, it's not necessarily going to hurt you to plank on the side, although it messes up your shoulders. You know the way that you do it is. I mean, it's not good for your shoulder. To, to prop yourself on the elbow that way. That's really the weak link more than it is the core for that exercise, right? If you know what you're talking about. Yeah. And, it, and, and, you know, it, sagittal brace against resist, fantastic, right? Fantastic, right? It, and, and I'm not saying that it's not good to flex and extend. You basically flex and extend when you breathe. And so, but, but that as an exercise to, to, to brace against the sagittal, yeah, that's great. You know, get real strong at that. That's good, right? But I would say that holding some ground-based plank, I mean, when you can do something for, fifth, you know, when some guy breaks the record by doing it for three days or whatever he does, I, you know, oh, I'm going to hold a plank for a minute. It, if, that's, if that's a challenge for you, then do it. But if it's not a challenge for you, which it's not <laughs> for, for anybody who's strong, well, then it's not your best strategy, right? And if your time is precious and you're after athletic enhancement, well, then that's not really in your repertoire, bracing against sagittal, okay? I mean, your back hurts, okay, yeah, that's good, right? So McGill's good in that rehabilitative sense. But when he, you know, advocates the, you know, resist the twist, oh, you know, he doesn't call it a power off press, I think he calls it whatever, right? But but then you you got guys like Cresty who basically, you know, oh, McGill, 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 Right. And then they used McGill, McGill, McGill to say, oh, well, we need to brace and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, transverse, you know, is bad. Anti rotation is the answer. They're really talking about anti twist and they don't know what they're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Now they start doing stuff that's hard to do. It takes energy. It's your, oh, I'm stressing. Right. So you think it's good. You've discombobulated the nervous system to move well. You never resist a twist. It's only a figure eight, figure eight, figure eight. You know, locomotive figure eight is underhand, the fight is overhand and underhand. You know, the, the, the backstroke is underhand, the crawl is overhand, right? It's figure eights. Figure eights are great. Figure eight is how you're strong. Figure eight is, figure eight is infinity. Figure eight's infinity. The reason why we can throw so well compared to the primate is because we can supinate and pronate. <laughs> like, they can't. It's just so simple, right? So, and, and, and back to this idea of empty cup. Right. And, and not like, okay, you know, I'm finished. I'm done. Right. So what I've done is I've, I've, I've created a vessel. Okay. It, I've created a vessel with foundational biomechanical end game for locomotion. I know what we want to do and I've come up with certain bing, bing, bing things that help us do it. Right. And so it's, it's digging deeper in that. Now, with that understanding that you have the structure that you want to fill up and it's an additive fill up because you've got it. So it's sort of like it, it, rather than a vet, it's like digging for gold and you found the thread. There's just more and more down there, the deeper you go. Right. Or it's more concentrated, it's more precious, the deeper you go. So I go out and I spend two, two whole days with Marty Gallagher 
And oh, yeah. we, you know, we dig into it, dig into it, dig into it. And I get certain wisdom and insight because we both have a very, very deep Eastern training background into the Chinese internal arts. His more formal than mine, mine more sort of David Wecky. So that understanding, that commonality. Now when he get, provides me an insight, it's ba-ding! And so what do I do? I start to Weck methodize it. And what have I been doing for the past two weeks? I've been doing what Marty Gallagher taught me and creating a depth of understanding that yesterday at my son's Little League game, it was like a freaking, like, it was like, you know, the blossoming tree. I got all these nuggets of, oh, my God, I can do this, 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 based on that next 10 fingers that Marty Gallagher gave me. And Marty can you, Gallagher. Uh, can you uh, explain what it was that you were doing with him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically what Marty Gallagher is doing is he's using the, the suspension training to, to, to basically eke out the, the fullest range of motion to create the longest muscle belly that marries with the fascia. So what he does is it's extremely intense where you're going after the most intense contraction that you can, regulating it every microsecond because you can make the unique adjustments with the straps. And now when you get to the end range of motion, you let it go. You, you go to zero. You take ultimate yang and tension and you bring it to ultimate yin and you, you let it go. And what that does is now the muscle belly isn't at that here at the end range of motion, the muscle belly goes zoom. And now when you turn it on and you turn it on slowly, guess what? You have more integration with the connective tissue. There's less slack in the system. David Weck is faster. Why? Because he knows, he feels the truth. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So you're doing like a, like push up kind of things on like a TRX? Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. So basically, yeah, so basically what it is, is he, he's got a protocol for every muscle. What I do is I say, all right, well, I don't care about every muscle so much. I care about what I, you know, I care about the coil and the, the care of the locomotion, right? So he, he basically has a system that relates to anybody who wants to, you know, shape their body and get in great shape and just become overall strong, right? So that when they go to lift weights, they're stronger, right? Or whatever, they got a better base of strength. What I'm interested in is the principle to do what I do better, right? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't pretend to have like expertise outside of my realm of expertise because I'm not, I don't have an interest outside of my realm of expertise. I don't, I don't care about, you know, being strong in certain ways. I just don't care. That's not my specialty. Right. So what he has is he has a, a you know, basically a universal generalized approach using the straps better than anything I've ever seen in my life. And he, he boom, systemically guy, the guy is, you know, you don't, you don't get asked back, asked back to train the best of the best in the tactical world, right? I'm talking like the tier one special forces, right? Tier one meaning like this stuff is top secret, right? You know, you're dealing with the best and the best and the best of the world who they're going to call bullshit so fast. Yeah. Because they only, they only, it's life or death in the, re, in the most real sense possible. And you don't get asked back unless you're providing some value to that population, right? And especially what he has is ability. He's a he's a gifted writer, okay? Yeah. So when you're a gifted writer, you're able to express and articulate your thoughts in this in this poetic prose that that allows you to sort of dig in, get even deeper insight into what it is you're trying to do, right? So, so you have an extra tool to take the, the intuitive and, and articulate it and, and then dig yourself deeper by sort of having that capacity. So he has that capacity, plus just an unyielding, you know, he was brought up tough, you know, no bullshit. And he mentored with the best of the best, you know, the pioneers in the strength game. So he, and then he spent a long time studying Tai Chi and Bagua, I mean, the internal arts. So you couple all that stuff together and you got an extraordinary individual. And that's why we click so fast. We click, we click like that. Cause he's like, he's like, you know what? You're doing something new. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're doing something new. This has never been done before. Cause what I know wasn't taught to me. It's, it's, it's basically, I took all the information I could and then I, you know, assimilated and boom, boom, boom. And I figured out that a lot of information I was being taught wasn't optimal for the functional movements. Right, some of it counterproductive, as I've told and said here in this podcast 
many, many times. So I invented the, the methodology, right? Because I'm different, because I'm not afraid. And because I was put, I got the nature and the nurture, right? Had enough nature to be an inferior athlete that, that put the chip on my shoulder and gave me the, the motivation to know here because I don't have here. So that you put that fire in somebody and then you get the nurture, right? The, the best, an amazing hometown, an amazing college, New York City, right? Da, 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 da. Now you invent the BOSU ball and you get to spend every moment of your day doing whatever you want to do and whatever you want to do is optimize locomotion, right? right? Yeah, I think, that, uh, I think the guys like him and like Steve Cotter, it, you know, it's through him that I found you. Like people that can look at the BOSU ball is just something that, Silly people do, you know, stand on one leg and do a curls with tiny dumbbells and that kind of stuff. But like working with Marty Gallagher, with you know, people that are serious in the strength training are probably at least know his name, if not very, very familiar with his with his uh, with his work. And you were doing something with Donnie Thompson too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What, what, what was going What was going on with uh, – what were you doing with him? Well, with Donnie Thompson, um, he is just such a, such a jolly soul, right? And he's very, very creative and innovative, and he recognizes the value in what it is that I do. So, you know, we do that, and then I go, and I want to – listen, I'm a sponge, and I'm going to learn everything I can from you, right? So, you know, his body tempering, you know, where do you yeah. put these – massive rollers on the body and sort of allowing the, the weight to do the work. So you don't have, see, tension in one part of the body will result in some effect in another part of the body. And when you don't have to prop yourself up on top of it and it can do the work, you can create a better systemic relaxation. And again, get to those limits. The limits are where change happens. So if you're harboring some form of tension in your body, well, now how can you let go over there quite as much, right? So there's all this sort of stuff. So, and I just, and then it was just like, he's such a jolly soul. And you know what's great is to sit outside of his gym and, you know, have him smoke a cigar at 11 o'clock at night, and, you know, with all the characters that surround him. I mean, it's just, and, you know, that's life experience. And so that, you know, we forged a friendship and then we traded notes. That's what I did with Donnie Thompson. Yeah. And, yeah, it was, yeah, if people can, like, see that, yeah, you have some of the strongest people, like, putting their, associating their, uh, their name with yours now. And um, so like, when you're – Back to the like the, the the Bosu ball, and some of what I see that people do on it, it it, it kind of drives me crazy. I, I try not to be that judgmental trainer, but I am, and it's like it, it's like it, it does. It almost like it doesn't matter what somebody's like formal education is. They can have a, a master's degree in exercise physiology, and they can be brilliant but they you, you see what they're doing and this has been not just one or two this is like over and over and over i don't have anything wrong for uh, against education of course but it's like i almost care more about like who is your coach i don't care if you have a fancy degree from a fancy college that says you're good at exercise what can you actually do can you coach a squat because i've met plenty of people with master's degrees in exercise science and I look at them squat or coach a squat or not coach a squat and it's like what the hell is going on here how, how can that even happen and so can, can you talk about like what are you you're talking about the the compression on the uh the the bosu and we're talking about the swing the kettlebell swing on it it's like what else would you do and like is, is there things that you see yeah. That so drives yeah, there's crazy yeah. people using your tool in the wrong way. Well, here, here's the thing. Um, mark my words, the BOSU ball is going to take on a whole new light because now that I stand on the stage and I've changed the way that the world runs, now all of a sudden, 
people know me. Because right now, my personal audience is extremely small. People know a blue half ball. They don't know who David Weck is. But that's all changing, you know, very, very fast. And all of a sudden, everybody's going to know who I am. And what I have to say is going to be worth listening to. Okay, and so trust me when I say the Bosu ball is going to get a completely new evaluation and millions of people who don't currently use it will be drawn to it because it makes you better in results rule. Okay, and you're going to sort of trust enough to, to get your feet in the water when the guy who changed the way the world runs and turned everything in the, in the strength and conditioning world at the fundamental level in terms of power off, press, brace your quarter run kind of nonsense, flip that on his head. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna have the stage, and what I say will be heard, and and people will listen. Okay, so there's four principal things that you do with a boxing ball. Okay, the first one is compression. You do the compression. You do it through your hands, and you do it through your feet. It's very specific, and it yields an incredible result that's not possible on anything else. Okay, pretty cool. <laughs> Next is you do the core. You both brace and breathe, and you coil. Okay, very, very sp specific but simple exercises. There's not that many of them, and you just do them. You brace and breathe, because when you're lifting, that's brace and, brace and hold your breath. But you want to take that strength and bridge it, you got to brace and breathe, and then you want to make the most functional strength of it, you got to coil the core. Okay, so you do that. You do the compression, you do the core, the core bifurcated into the, uh, the brace and breathe and to the coil, and then you do ballistics and balance reflexive okay ballistics ballistics make your ankles and your feet bulletproof because it's so coordinating them and what's unique about a bosu ball that eric cressy doesn't know doesn't care to know or didn't care to know he will soon know is that you can load it with many fold times your body weight and it's always there underneath you it's stable. It's not going anywhere. It's not some inflatable air cushion that's making you rise tension up in your body and get all like discombobulated from the nervous system. If you're going to train on a dynatist the way that he had people train on dynatists, you better have 10 years to practice to the point where you can relax like a Cirque du Soleil person. Okay? Most of all happens right now. Right now. You're not in danger, but your body interprets any loss of balance as danger, but you're not in danger. A foot to the floor, problem's over. Yeah. Right? So now, ballistic training, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Your ankles get extremely smart. They get extremely strong to feet everything. And it just so happens that that dome shape gives you the biomechanics of the way that you want to load the ground athletically. One of the things that Donnie Thompson loves about me is that he trains his ankles and his feet on the BOSU balls every single day. We did a body tempering uh, you know, seminar. He brought me in to teach feet and ankles. Right? Feet and ankles. And he started out the session with him. Okay, guys, this is what I do. I do every single day. And he brought us through his routine. Two Bosu balls, he goes through a whole routine. Every single day, because he thinks feet and ankles are the key to it all. Because that's where the force is going through. Okay? So ballistic training. And you just put a jump rope on a Bosu ball. It's incredible. Right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, I, I take an athlete and say, jump up and down on a Bosu ball. That's going to get old real quick. But you hand him a jump rope. You say, good. Learn how to do that. <laughs> now you got something. Right? And once mm -hmm. you learn how to do it, bang, it's in your toolbox, you can come, you do 90 seconds, okay, great, you're moving better, right? And it just neurologically program my ankles to be super smart and super strong. And the gait pattern of, I've now patterned the foot to do it better, okay? So, and then balance and reflexive. Learn how to close your eyes on that thing. Learn how that when you lose your balance, don't freak out. Don't, don't, right? Tension rises up when you freak out. You you cannot change your reaction time, but you can change your reaction response. So so your ability to to interpret the signal is basically 0 0.16. 0 0.16 seconds or thereabouts means that that's as fast as you're going to react to the gun, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're going to react. There's a delay before before the signal reaches your action. Okay, and that's. That's finite. You, you're not going to make that zero and you're not going to get it under, you know, some value. You know, fastest in the world might be like 0.12 or whatever the heck it is. I don't know. But, but you can change the response time. And if your first response is tension coming up, well, guess what? You can't load the ground as fast. You don't move as fast. So you're, the, the, the equation is now slower. Oh, it's about ground loading. Oh, that's not new. 
Mm-hmm. So why the hell you been teaching everybody not to do it better? Why the hell are you raising the hand when the foot's going down on the same side? Why the hell are you doing that? Deion Sanders didn't do it. Randy Moss didn't do it. Right? Lars Taylor didn't do it. Daryl Daryl Green didn't do it. A lot of guys don't do it. <laughs> right? Mm. Oh. But you can't see it, so you don't know it, and you think something else. And your guru, your coach, you know, you thought so, right? You were taught that. It's bleeding energy. It's leaking power. It's spilling out. You're not getting all that you can out of the track. Blah, 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 blah. Right? So four things you do with a motion ball. You compress it. You do the core. You do the ballistics. And you do the balance and reflexive. It's very simple. It doesn't have to hijack your workout. You don't have to use it for the whole session, right? Little chunk. And it's very, very energy efficient. So it's time efficient and energy efficient because in high level training, it's a zero sum game. You can't just add different stuff in. If you're adding something, you're taking something else out. All right. Mm-hmm. And the first thing you should take out is your bow off press, get rid of it <laughs> and it, get rid of it gone. Right. And stop doing anything 50, 50. Don't put both hands like this. Don't put both hands like this. If you're resisting transverse, right. You, you, you can't be 50-50 because then it's not rotate. Then it's not coil. Then you're not training the figure eight. And again, w- what I'm saying is correct, and I don't take my word for it. I don't care. You're going to get on board at some point. If you're not on board now, you're going to get on board because you ain't teaching the Western roll and the high jump. That's what it is, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and one of the things that I like about the way that I'm doing this is that it is bold, and it's in your face, right? And it's like, okay. You know, I'm not putting sugar on this medicine. You take this medicine. You know why you're going to take this medicine? Because it makes you better. That's why you're going to take this medicine. I don't need to put sugar on it. Sugar's bad for you anyway. Right? Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm like a, I'm a... You come out and you're, you're bold with your, your message, and it, it's true. You have professional athletes working with you. They're already super fast, and you're making them faster. And so what, you know, oh, that's, let, let, me say, let me just, let me just say, that's another thing, right? You get these, there was some, there was some guy down in Australia or wherever the hell he is, you know, some kettlebell down there and, you know, he's on Facebook and he gets really mad. And at one of my posts, he's like, well, who the hell have you ever worked with? Right. You know, I get my information from a guy who did this, that, the other thing. Right. Oh, Okay. Like, you got a vent like that, and then he starts being preposterous. So what I, I block him. That's your punishment, dude. You, mm-hmm. you don't get to play with me. The only, the only way that the gate guys, that, that this guy from Exos, the, you know, that, that basically just destroyed some kid's pro day with, with stupid, willful ignorance, and, and this guy from Australia, the only way they come back into the, into the mix and have any interaction with me or are authorized to do anything that is my intellectual property, my brands, my patents, trademarks, is I want, I want apology. I want apology and I don't want, to me, I want it public. I want you to tell the world how you were wrong, how you behaved poorly, how you basically were willfully ignorant in the face of the truth. And then, and then, you, then we can be friends because we're, we're all going to be friends in the end. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tolerate a bully who's who's coming at me aggressively because I'm bold on the internet here, and I'll defend my ideas and I'll have an articulate conversation. But I ain't gonna. Do, I'm not gonna suffer fools lightly if you're gonna be willfully ignorant. Yeah. I block the gate guys. I, the gate guys can't see what I'm doing, and I can't post on their stuff, right? Because mm-hmm. because I'm done with them. And the only way I I need to see the public apology. I need to see, I need to see, I was wrong, here's why, and now I know better, right, from certain people. Because you're not going to come at me, there's a consequence, because if there's not a consequence, well then, you know, it's, it, there's, a, there's a high school football t- uh, coach in town here who did something incredibly bold. He has a zero tolerance policy for certain things. And a couple of years back, he cut, he cut his three best players because they did the intolerable, the zero tolerance. They did it. Now, it was not in the interest of his team. You ready to go? Okay, I'll be there in just two minutes and we'll wrap it up. All right. Um, he cut the three best players on his team because they did the zero tolerance. And if you don't make an example, they're not consequences. Well, then, okay, well, there's just no consequences. and There's no change, right? Yeah. And so I'm going to – 
there's consequences you want to be irrational to me. Yeah, I can definitely vouch for uh, when uh, somebody asks you questions on your Facebook post, I don't understand this. Can you explain what this is? You'll explain it, but I also, I'm not, so, and you did that with me a bunch of times, but I'm not coming at you with like, BOSU balls are stupid. Prove to me why, why, they're, why they're okay. It's like, right. I'm, I'm trying to really understand because people pay me to know what I'm talking about, and, and I, I'm trying to really understand something that I didn't understand before, and, and I still have a lot to understand. Your, your method is super advanced, and I'm, I think I'm, I'm getting it, and um, I plan on getting the, the pulsers. I haven't been able to run for a while. I had a, a knee injury from jujitsu, and I'm getting to where I think I can do some short runs now, and I was going to um, – uh, buy at least one pair and uh, so um, I know you need to get going uh, so is uh, like what kind of closing thoughts do you have what kind what how can people get a hold of you so basically here, here's my clothing uh, closing thoughts so first of all Ryan I want to thank you for reaching out to me uh, both on the Facebook with the questions and the curiosity right so I want to thank you for that because all I care about is awareness at this point good bad and different as long as people are reasonable then I just care about the awareness, right? Because that's what makes this go forward. And then to all of your listeners out there who have listened this far, right? If you listen this far, then you care, then you have the capacity to be a shepherd, right? You're not a sheep. You're on the cutting edge. If you've listened to me, if you're hearing me right now, it means that you're one of us, right? And it means that you either hate me or you love me, but you're not indifferent, right? So that's the key. So what I say is... Um, Pioneers of Pulsing on Facebook, go to weckmethod.com. The story's being written and it's not going to stop. So I just want to thank everybody, right? Because ultimately, like I said, we're all friends in the end. We all have this common objective. But if I weren't doing it the way I'm doing it, it would take a lot longer to change because the powers that be don't want to change. And the way humanity works, it's human nature. You only do something when you have to, okay? So that's why I'm here. That's what I'm doing. And again, thank you so much. I'm going to go take my son to, uh, to his little league. He's, he's like the, he's like the home run guy. Yeah, I know. I've, right? seen, uh, I've, how, I've seen him hit. He's, he's awesome. And, 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 how, and how do you run the bases, bud? What do you, <laughs> that's right, baby. All right, Ryan, thank you again for this. Yeah, thank you. That was a perfect way to end it. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Okay, sounds great. All right, thanks. All right, home. thank you so much, Ryan. I can't, I can't let's uh, just let me know when it's going to publish. Okay, I'm going to hit pause for a second. Okay. okay.